Okay, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is your host, Pat Flynn. We are joined once again by Dr. Brian Kempel. We're going to do an introduction to philosophical thinking, semiotics, and whatever else we want to talk about today. So, Brian, welcome back to the podcast. Good to have you. Uh, thanks for having me, Pat. It's good to be here. Yes, indeed. It's been a few months, at least, since our previous conversation. Always a joy to chat with you. So before we get into it, uh, give us an update. What have you been working on? Uh, I know you have a number of new publications out. So yeah, catch us up. Yeah, well, lots of stuff at the Lyceum. Uh, first of all, we've been uh, doing uh, a, a trivium program, which has been very exciting, uh, working on, on uh, classic liberal arts, uh, grammar, uh, starting logic in January. Uh, going to have rhetoric sometime, I don't know, maybe April or, or, or May, thereabouts. Um, not 100% certain on the, the schedule yet. Um, just uh, published a, a new book on grammar myself on, on linguistic signification, a classic and semiotic course in grammar and composition. It's, uh, it's heavy. It comes in hardcover or paperback. Hold it up a little closer to the camera. That is a beautiful cover. Look at that. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice one. uh uh, Caravaggio, looks... St. Jerome uh, writing. So. That is so cool. And where where can uh, the gentle listener grab a, a copy uh, of two of that? Sadly, so far, only on Amazon. Uh, I'm, I'm looking <laughs> Gotta at feed the machine, huh? as well. But uh, Amazon's just so easy. They make it so I easy. I hate it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's also a nice uh, hardcover of, uh, issue one of, of reality as well that people can go now if you want to something a little more a little more durable it's got a little larger margins too which um i'm i'm a margin annotator myself so uh, if you like taking notes in the margins I, I love the whole aesthetic look that you guys have going on very 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 cool there i i i just had the uh issue the soft cover issue of reality sitting around but oh wait is this it no, no, I don't know where it is. Anyway, the hardcover looks great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, soft cover is uh, it's, it's a little, uh, it's, you know, it's more affordable for one, um, and it, you can probably still get it before Christmas uh, if if you have uh, any philosophy fans in your family or, or friends who you want a present for. Uh, either one of those, you can find them on Amazon. You can probably just plug my name in and and find them as well. The gift of philosophical thought. What could be what could be better than that? Hey, real quick before we dive in, tell people a little bit more about um, about reality. What can people expect from that journal? What sort of topics you, did you guys cover in that first issue? And and that sort of thing. Yeah, the the, the first issue is really um, structured around this this idea that uh, Dan Wagner and I uh, put together in in the introduction. Uh, more more Dan than myself, um, but that really for for something to be philosophy, it has to be realism. Mm -hmm. uh, that if it isn't if it isn't realistic, it, it isn't really philosophy. Um, that you're you're sort of just playing with ideas and, and sophistry to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. So sorry to to you know, sort of crap on a larger part of the. Of the <laughs> it's going to it's going to trigger some people to be yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, we sort of make that argument in in the introduction, and then dive into a, a few different uh, sort of topics where we we. Um, talk about what's real, right? And, and how can we philosophically investigate that? Um, sense realism, uh, I deal with an, an article on, on semiotic realism, I call it. Uh, then we have the, the realism of, of a philosophy of evil and of, of culture and mm -hmm. politics, um, the, the political real. And so what we do a little bit different in this journal than the average academic journal, a um, couple of things uh, first and, and foremost, uh, we have a different process of peer review. So for those of you who are unaware, peer review is normally very, it's, it's very behind the curtains kind of thing, right? And it's, uh, you don't really know what's happening. It's blind. You don't know who your reviewers are. You don't necessarily know the reasons fully that your, your article is accepted or rejected. Uh, so the, re the reviewers very often might be the people you're criticizing, right? <laughs> right. And so it's, it's very behind the curtain, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, of approach, which I think works better in something like science than in philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, science, you know, there's, there's reasons to have a sort of blind peer review process in, in sure. a lot of scientific studies, but in philosophy, you're just, you're taking dialogue out of the picture. Right. And, and increasingly you find some journals tend towards sorts of dominant monological voices, uh, which is antithetical to philosophy's very nature, I think. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a, a quality review process, we call it, make sure that submissions are up to standards, uh, that they, they sort of 
you know, fit the tone and, and fit the right voice and, and have, you know, serious rigor in them. Uh, but then after that, we publish it online and, and welcome open peer review, we call it. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's, who's qualified, who has a good voice, who has a good argument, can submit a response to a published article. Yeah, and then cool. we'll publish them together. We'll put them in, you know, this this open format. So our subtitle is a journal for a journal for philosophical discourse. Uh, so we want that that real, you know, back and forth communication that seemed so uh, substantial in in you know the Latin scholastic period. Right, that that's where the progress was made in philosophical thinking was, hey, we're gonna, you know, objections and replies and you know back and forth and sort of you know. Uh, how, how do we really shape our understanding? I'm trying to do that in a way which isn't, you know, just repeating scholasticism. We're not just repeating right. the actual objection or reply format, but uh, trying to have that, that level of discourse, that level of back and forth um, to, to sort of hone one another's understanding. Um, so that's one thing that we do that's a little different. Another thing is open access. Uh, uh, you know, uh, everything's online for free. Bringing uh, philosophy to the people. Got to love bringing it. Bringing it to the people. Yeah. So uh, just trying to trying to do do the good work in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, let me let me again just just encourage people to go and, and support what you guys are doing, because I think it's so cool. And like, you know, there's there's a number of good journals out there, but I think anybody who's kind of been in in philosophical circles for a while will will understand exactly what you're talking about, right? There's also many limitations to use a charitable word <laughs> with how some of these these journals operate. I mean, sometimes you're just outright corruption, right? <laughs> uh, you know, human nature, whatnot. So I love this idea of this sort of the, yeah, just bringing back that I think the true nature of the sort of discourse that makes good philosophy, good philosophy. So where, where's, uh, you can get the first issue on, on Amazon, but uh, is it, uh, what's the what's the website again? Yeah, it's a reality journal, all one word, dot org. Awesome. Um, and you can download a PDF of the whole issue there as well. So. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, all right. So let's talk, I, I do want to hit on, before we start getting into, I guess this is an introduction to philosophical thought, because you made a pretty striking claim there, that if you're not thinking as a realist, then you're not thinking philosophically, right? All right. Let's 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 talk about that. I mean, what do we mean then by realism? With, with, with somebody who's, a, 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 a say, a Barclayan idealist, uh, do they do they get a, a, a seat at the at the lunch table here at the philosopher's lunch table or or or, or, or are they dismissed as a sophist? Well, I mean, they they, they can sit there um, <laughs> and they can listen, um, but I'm not sure they have much to say. And and I mean, part of what what I think is important here, though, is to really qualify what we mean by real. Mm -hmm. um, we use the word real uh, all the time, just in, in common, you know, everyday vernacular conversation talk about well that isn't real or this relationship isn't real or uh you know be real so on and so forth right we use we use the word real all the time uh, but i'm not sure we always think very carefully as to what we mean about it and I, when i say we i mean everyone i mean mm -hmm. philosophers genuine philosophers even realist philosophers as well as as the everyday you know layman um you know i, I don't think you need to have a degree to be a philosopher but um <clears throat> in the, the genuine sense of a lover of wisdom. But, you know, one of the things that's that's problematic uh, that I, I see here so often is everyone presumes what they mean by real, and they presume that what they mean by real is what's really real, and that uh, everyone else shares that. And that's not always, I think, necessarily the case. Um, so, you know, we think about um, something like uh, the government is the government real? There's a nice uh, controversial question for all the libertarians out there. Um, well, I mean, what do we mean? What what is the reality of something like government, or the reality of something like a friendship? Right? Or what Texas? Mean, what about Texas? Texas is Texas real, or is Wyoming real? I think that's a, a, a more uh, realistic question because uh, uh, you know you fly over Wyoming and you look down and you say, okay, there's nothing there. It's not real. <laughs> Just one uh, gigantic privation right now. Yeah. Uh, our privation is real. There we go. Our privation is real. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's part of the, the, the interesting question. Um, and I mean, this has gone back into sort of the, the depths of my own philosophical research in graduate school. Uh, it's, it's a sort of curious um, issue for, for Thomists in particular, for, you know, people who are, are fans, adherents of the thought of, of Thomas Aquinas, 
you read a lot of Thomistic literature and you come across this, this phrase, ends reale, real being. Uh, it's fascinating to me that that's never in Thomas Aquinas anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can search the from beginning to end of Thomas Aquinas's writings, and he never uses that phrase, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that so many Thomists do. And and even not long after Thomas Aquinas himself, it mm -hmm. seems like within uh, maybe decades, even people who are are Thomists or or adherents of Thomistic thoughts to some degree or another use the phrase "entreale." Um, but really, what they're using it to describe is what Aquinas calls "ens naturae," natural being, right. Uh, being that has a source of existence in or from or through itself somehow mm -hmm. not that it's the you know, originator of its existence but its existence resides in in itself mm -hmm. uh, and this is contrasted to, to ends rationis or beings of reason uh, yeah. beings which are are um, you know constituted somehow through our own cognitive activity so this, this contrast, uh, when, when it gets set up as real being and rational being or being of reason, uh, I think is, is problematic, right? Because then we're, we're already trending towards dualism there. We're mm -hmm. trending towards, here's the stuff in the mind, and here's the stuff that's real. Sure. And the stuff mm -hmm. that's in the mind isn't real. <laughs> that's, that's just, uh, it's, it's so, um, such a stark severance, right? Do you think it would be fair, not to interject too soon here, but to say that instead of it not being real, do you think Thomas should say there's different levels of fundamentality, different orders there? Well, I, I don't know about fundamentality. I'm, a little, uh, I'm always hesitant when we start getting too many uh, itties uh, at, at the <laughs> end of our words, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's different levels of independence, and I think maybe that's the way of looking. Yeah, at it. That's, and that's I think that's the same right, idea yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that you're you're going with there, right? Indeed, um, indeed. Uh, and, and this kind of even tracks a little bit with the scholastic uh, language and difficulty as well that they start talking about absolute being. Right? Mm -hmm. They start talking about substance as absolute being, uh, but it's not really absolute, right? <laughs> In the scholastic mind, it's it's relatively absolute. Because mm -hmm. the only absolute absolute is God. Everything yeah. else is dependent in some way, in some measure. Mm -hmm. um, so along with that that independence, uh, there's there's relative independencies that go on as well. Right? That uh, you know, we start talking about real relations, for instance, um, relations of action and passion, or based upon properties which are intrinsic to things. Right? The, there's a real relation between you and I, even if no one makes the comparison in terms of, say, height. Mm -hmm. right? Even if we never met each other, never encountered each other in any way, there's probably a real difference in our height. I don't, we're exactly the same. I don't know how tall you are. Uh, but, probably uh, not as tall as you. You look like a pretty tall guy, even sitting down. Uh, I'm, I'm six foot. Is, is, okay, yeah, so, not quite, yeah. not quite. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a real difference, right? Um, that's a real relation. Uh, there's, there's, we each have a property of height mm -hmm. and, you know, my height is different than yours. And so there's, mm -hmm. that's a real thing. Um, so that's relatively independent of, of the mind. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> but then there's something like, okay, well, uh, you know, we've, we've had a few of these, these chats, we're kind of friends now, right? We've mm -hmm. had some exchange that's dependent upon our, our understanding. That's dependent right. upon our, our knowledge. So it's not independent of our cognition but it's still something real mm -hmm. it's not something that's just made up or fictitious or a fantasy or something like that it's not a pure imagination of of one independent mind uh, unless you're secretly plotting against me <laughs> someone that i don't know about mm -hmm. right uh, which i don't i don't think you are i, I don't know for right. sure. well that, that that brings us back to our conversation we had on skepticism radical right <laughs> yeah right uh, which which but, to my mind that's just kind of like there's a structural similarity between like radical conspiracy theories and descartes demon like what's the difference <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day yeah. you know what i mean right, right. <laughs> anyways yep. well yeah um so you know i i don't have reason right to believe that you're plotting against me i have reason to believe that you're you're genuinely uh friendly towards me and there's a there's a real sort of friendship of, of a kind that's that's growing uh, as as we continue to have conversations and talk to one another and get to know one another um so there's you know th this this reality um how do we acknowledge it how do we understand it how do we know what it is 
Um, I think that's that's really what philosophy is, is asking those questions, not just about the, the cognition independent things in the world, but about these social, relational, cognition dependent elements of our experience also. Right. Uh, that these these are parts of what's real. And by real, uh, what we mean is that they have a kind of, of intelligible being of themselves, even if their existence is in some way dependent upon our cognitive activity. Mm. So friendship, right? Okay, it's something which depends upon people acknowledging and knowing and thinking about each other, but it still has a reality which isn't reducible to that. I can't right. just think someone into being a friend. Right? <laughs> uh, um, just like you can't think someone into being your your girlfriend. Sorry, fellas. Um, as as much as you see, you know, guys try to maybe uh, get into those sorts of, of tendencies, right? Trying to think these things into existence. No, there's a reality to the pattern of relations mm -hmm. uh, that we have to acknowledge, even if we're somewhat constituted of it through our own action. Um, so I think that's, you know, uh, where we're at with this that's th that's helpful then realism. so so then um it that would be strongly contrasted with not just a, a sort of cartesian picture of the world like you've said but also various eliminativist or reductivist positions too like may maybe the 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 barclian um could agree with and i'm not i'm not an idealist right but um unless you think of like classical theism as in some broad sense to be is to be thought about by God, like uh, how they would think or something like that. But generally I don't classify myself as, as an idealist, but maybe they could even agree something like that with everything you just said. And then it will just come down to, okay. Um, the question of, of dependency and, and independence of these, of just trying to get those classifications, right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know, and I think, uh, Barclay is always an interesting example, right? Because you can, you can say that he's, well, he's, he's the most idealist rationalist, or he's the most empiricist, um, <laughs> to be sure. Yeah. Idealist, um, of, of any of them, right? He's a, he's a hard one to classify. Um, and I, I think what's distinctive about the approach to realism that I'm advocating that uh, reality advocates is for one thing, it's very Aristotelian in, in, in its base, right? And it's very much um, taking as a, sort of a first premise that the world makes sense. Now we might struggle making sense of the world, but the world, the universe, the, the primary things in our experience are, are primary for a reason. And they, and so they, think, they are intelligible. Even if we haven't grasped the full intelligible ability, they are intelligible, right? Right, they are intelligible, and that cl includes our way of encounter with the world, which is through sensation. Yeah. Um, that the, the idealist sort of has to take as a first premise that our, our experience is deceitful in some way. Right. I was I was just going to say, how much do you, especially in epistemology, um, <clears throat> want to grant to intuitions and seemings? Because to me is. Um, I mean, every worldview has certain uh, difficulties, right? It has certain certain um, challenges. There's there's none that I've found anyway. Maybe there's one out there, but there's none that I've found that are completely free of of at least superficial tensions and stuff like that, right? But some seem to accrue immediate significant costs, right? <laughs> right. Um, you just hinted at one with idealism, like okay, now we we have a huge cost to just like very basic intuitions, right? It just really seems use language of seemings that there is a world independent of my mind right and now you're asking me to, to think that that's that's radically off well now i have serious questions about my cognitive reliability in general see what i'm saying right so for me idealism in in a sense like various and it is eliminativist i guess in a sense if you think like that right uh seems to accrue certain costs that i think i don't know i, I i've never been able to see how those those costs can be sustained whereas as a realist doesn't have those issues you see what i'm getting at yeah um i mean you you do right i i, I think what idealism or materialism right um they always sort of end up in a, a de facto dualism like i don't think you can avoid it actually um because as as you say you, there's a cost right uh, that, that's paid immediately you have to get rid of some part of experience whether you're an idealist or, or a radical materialist you have to say mm -hmm. that 
something of what's going on in my life isn't really real. Either the material world is in some way, it's it's not really the, the real or it's not the reality that I experience, um, that that's things that my mind are making up for, for me, whether that mind is, is spiritualist or it's radically neuroreductivist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're saying that some part of what's going on here is is fabricated for me. Uh, you're you're a Kantian, can't get at the ding on sick, uh, you know, the thing outside of the mind, or you're a, a limitative materialist, a la Dennett, or the church lens, where uh, well, almost everything that I think that I'm experiencing isn't really real. It's just atoms and you know particles and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so that's uh, yeah, uh, th they're two sides of the same uh, coin, uh, the, ignoring the other side of the coin, right? Uh, ignoring the existence of the other side of the coin, so it's uh, it's deeply problematic. I do want to ask to 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 maybe have a little dialogue here. What what is it that you mean though when you say intuitions? <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, my my epistemological sympathies are broadly Reedian, right? Uh, so I think we have intuitions all across. I think we have epistemic intuitions, right? So I don't, I don't, I don't even mean anything much more than it just really seems like two plus two equals four, right? We have moral intuitions, right? It just really seems like this is where you get the language of seemings in some of this literature that rape is just an evil, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that uh, intuitions are infallible. I don't want to take because because clearly they could be off. But I think one of the best defenses of, of realism and, and especially natural law is it seems to make the best sense of our best intuitions. And for me, as, as somebody who, who, again, like a broadly radiant perspective and, and wants to think, OK, if we're going to escape sort of radical skepticism, if we're going to secure uh, the kind of secure realism, then we then like we're kind of stuck with the epistemological posture, whatever particular theory you want to adopt of having to say that our cognitive faculties are generally reliable if not infallible and that's of course not going to include things like perception and memory but i would say it includes these sort of uh, basic intuitions as well right um and so what i look for in in certain worldview situations is okay what worldview is going to allow is going to like make the best sense of that posture is going to be able to secure that posture uh well uh, and in other considerations equal i think a sort of classical theism picture gives us a really good sort of metaphysics to support that epistemology and if there's other pictures of the world where i start have to accruing significant costs immediately up front i mean take a take a materialist atheistic cost it's not just certain uh i, I mean beliefs about god right that the atheist is going to have to say all of our intuitive beliefs about god aren't just a little bit off right they're fundamentally deluded <laughs> right to me that's a huge epistemological cost right and and, and and for for me, I think that there's sort of this normative web. There's actually that's the name of a great book, the normative web, right? That that kind of makes this this case about intuitions in general, epistemic and moral. That it's it's really hard if you start kind of breaking them in one area that you don't see why you, it's not arbitrary to just start breaking all of them, right? And you kind of collapse into these skeptical situations. So. I don't know if that answers so, your question, well, but that's kind well, of. I want to. I want to push a little bit further. I'm going to be a little bit of a gadfly today. Good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah this is a. This is. This is for the people. It's a dialogue. Yeah. So wherever you want to go yeah. with it. Uh huh. Uh, so so, um, when we say intuition, then are are you using it to signify something like a, a spontaneous realization of some coherence? Right? Sounds like this. sounds sort of Lonergarian, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I've got my issues with Lonergarian. I know you do. So I know, which is why I'm surprised you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. well, well, no, because uh, I, I mean, I, I would object to it, right? Uh, to the yeah. spontaneity, mm -hmm. right? Um, not to say that spontaneity doesn't have a place in the universe. I, I think it does. Yeah. Uh, but when we say this, this spontaneous, or you know, um, arising of something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's always based on something that's already there, right? We might become spontaneously aware of it, yes, but right. it uh -huh. doesn't come ex nihilo, right? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's it's on the basis of of prior activities, of prior actualizations, mm -hmm. rendering us in potency for this to come into being, right? Um, to, to put it in terms of a sort of Aristotelian uh, metaphysics, mm -hmm. um, and this is something that's that's uh, talked about by. Uh, we sort of, you know, hinted at before that semiotics is going to be a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the the founder of semiotics, the first, you know, 
formal semiotician, I guess we could say, Charles Sanders Peirce, mm -hmm. a very curious fellow, lived mostly during the 19th century, uh, 1839 to 1914. Um, very controversial for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, very confused by a lot of people who've read his work because they read snippets out of context and mm -hmm. didn't get the whole picture. Uh, but one of his early publications, I want to say in 1868, uh, was um, Questions Concerning Certain Faculties Claimed for, for Man, uh, is mm -hmm. the title of the article. They're very wordy in the 1860s, I guess, with their article titles. Um, <clears throat> but he's he's questioning, you know, do we have a faculty of intuition? Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean to say that we have intuitions? And he says, no, we don't have intuitions because every cognition that we have is based upon some previous cognition. And I think that's maybe you can take that a little bit too far. And mm -hmm. then you're applying the word cognition a little too broadly. Yeah. But I mean, it's true. If you think about your own thoughts that you have now, right? There's no thought that you're having that isn't determined or set up in some way by previous thoughts. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. And so that go, where do you go back? Where do you find the line of demarcation of the first thought that you have, which is determining things? Yeah. The mm -hmm. first thought that you can remember having, even that, you know, is determined by thoughts that you don't remember having. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those were probably determined in some way biologically by, by the structure of your physical organism that allows you to have, you know, uh, sensations and things like that. It allows mm -hmm. you to have this, this, building up of experience which develops gradually towards having thoughts so the idea that we can have some sort of intuition the, the totally spontaneous awareness of something is a little bit of a, a, a problematic sort of notion i think and part of the problem i think is also tied to the the historically laden confusion of the word intuition itself yeah yeah i, I understand those those confusions and i would want to clarify that um you're not advocating a strict determinism by what you just said, right? No. Okay. No. So I just, I just want to, I want to clear that up because it's, it, it's right that there is a, there is a certain linking, but I want to make it clear for the gentle listeners that you're not, you're, you're not a sort of <laughs> reductive physicalist determinist in our thoughts, well, right? Well, yeah. Right. Because right. part of, part of the very nature of thought, the very, very nature of cognition is that no matter how determined your thought is, mm -hmm. there's still vagueness in there. There's still elements of indeterminacy it's just part of the nature of thinking. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're meaning determinacy of, of, of meaning, right? Of conceptual right. content, not right. determinacy like a physical determinist. So just to, just right. to make that clear. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, no. So when I think, yeah, no, I don't think um, we have to, the way I think about it is we don't have to take Lonergan's position. And in fact, the, I think when I think of Lonergan and we should maybe try and catch some of the people up who aren't, who aren't familiar, he is trying to do like a, a very pure epistemology. Right. Like and I, I think I agree with Norris Clark that that's probably can't be done. Right. right. Um, now I'm deeply influenced by Lonergan, um, but I think Clark's critiques were right. I don't think there's any such thing as a pure epistemology, which Lonergan, and I think I think Lonergan kind of conceded that later on, didn't he? I, I, if, I don't know, I'm not steeped in Lonergan, so I can't. Yeah, I think he be, I think he did begrudgingly concede that after after insight or at least he like change things without acknowledging having 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 conceded it yeah so um okay so so maybe maybe then there's just a, a sort of terminology thing going on then because maybe thomas will just use such things as sight right of, of a broad idea of, of sight right that we have certain uh, sights um so i'd be curious how you would then sort of cash out various epistemic norms from from your uh uh sort of um cognitional theory you know and, and epistemic norms are just sort of one of some of the easiest ones i think to start with and maybe we could go to like moral norms or, or something like that right yeah um you know i mean i, th I think uh maybe we can qualify this a little bit and we were talking about right because right, when we talk about like uh, well we can just we can just see that two plus two equals four right, right. now some people are perfectly happy just stopping there, right? And saying like, no, this, and then they'll just call that an intuition, right? No, we just sort of right. see by direct sight, once we understand <clears throat> the concepts here, we we just see, right? And I think that's sort of 
that sort of bedrock. Now, other people think, no, we actually can go can go further than that. We can deconstruct that a little bit further. So I'd just be curious your thoughts on all that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think um, what we do, generally speaking, is as human beings, we have certain primordial conceptions. I mean, this is, um, this is hinted at in Aristotle. It's developed by Aquinas, particularly in his commentary on the metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't have, I think it's somewhere in book six, but I can't remember exactly. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, the first thing that we know is, is you know, as Aquinas says repeatedly, drawing on Avicenna as well, is is being. This is the first intellectual concept that we have, which is to say that unlike other animals, uh, we don't reduce things to their utility to ourselves when mm -hmm. we acknowledge them, when we recognize them. We say that there's being to this thing that it has its own in itselfness, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it's irreducible to me. It has its own intelligibility, its own conceptualizable, conceptualizability, whatever we want to call it. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we develop other concepts. We say, okay, well, one of which is unity, right? Unity that this thing is one. Right? Yeah. That's a primordial intellectual conception. And all of our mathematical knowledge our mathematical intuitions are resoluble to that concept of unity right just uh, like pro propositions themselves can be composed with concepts right you can break right. composition yeah and so when we don't have to go through a process sort of dialectical procedure to discern how things are resoluble i think that's mostly what we're calling what we mean when we say things are intuitive or intuited is right that we don't have to make a, a mental process okay well two plus two okay well each one of these twos is is uh you know one unity and another unity and i put them together and i call that two right we don't have to do that right so non-inferential is what you're saying right, right? yeah uh, i mean the inference is made but it's made so easily that we don't have to struggle for it right right yeah and that's that's how a number of people defending intuitions today would do it like michael bergman right they're saying these is sort of it's, it is non-inferential right um and it's interesting because a number of people, I think Trent Doherty defends this position uh, from his epistemology, which I think is broadly Plantinkian. But he wants he wants to say that from from his perspective of of intuitions, I think, and I hope I don't get him wrong. And if he if I do, then uh, you know, mea culpa. Uh, he thinks we just just do uh, our sort of implicit knowledge of God or intuition of God just is us doing natural theology implicitly right and then the purpose of natural theology is to make all that explicit right in a sense and that's an interesting thought i haven't thought about it too deeply but i'm, I'm pretty sure that's at least doherty's position which i guess i don't know if that's compatible with what you're saying or not i'm just throwing yeah, this I mean, out I, on the I'm, table I'm, here I'm, right I'm, I'm hesitant anytime that the the explanation is sort of along the lines of it just is right um you know that's just uh, how things are that's just what we're doing uh, and part of the reason for this is that uh, all of our knowledge is uh, essentially mediated by signs. So let's let, let pause right there just just for one second because yeah. we say I mean some things. Would you say some things are just it? Or we could say it just is right. Call that an aut autonomous fact, right? Like if I say, well, why are why are all mothers parents, right? Well, that's just what mothers are, right? Uh, well, right, yeah. I mean, if we have a, a sort of uh, tautological statement, right, where wherein the the predicate is implied or in contained in the meaning of the subject and vice versa, then then yeah, right? I mean, we can say that just is, right? But that's not an explanation of what it is. Right? Could you, would that's... you say that um, if we can capture a, an essence by a real definition? And then we ask, why is it that real definition? Would it be appropriate to say, well, that's just what it is and just end explanations there? Uh, I, I think that actually is sort of, um, the, the, that only really applies if it's a nominal definition, right? Uh, rather than a real definition. Uh, that To just say that, well, that just is what it is, right? We're just exchanging one set of words for another in that case. So, so say... having. Say to, What's to have a real definition, you have to have a causal explanation for what's going on there. Otherwise, it's it's not really defining, explaining the limits of the object which we're we're, you know, putting into words. Yeah. So I, I can understand with a nominal definition, definitely like that's just what we're calling this thing, and and just deal with it, right? But say a real definition. This is hard, right? Because any example I'm going to give is going to be controversial. But say water and H two O. Somebody mm -hmm. asked, well, why is water H two O? You think we need to go further than just saying, well, that's just what water is? 
Uh, I mean, in a way, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would, I would even sort of argue against H two O being the definition. I, I agree. I, I don't. I think that's inadequate too. But that's why I right. said it would be controversial. <laughs> right. Um, and so, with purely um, inorganic substances, it's, it's actually difficult to come up with real definitions for what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, part of which I think is because they always exist in an in, in interdependent context of their intelligibility. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't think about water just in terms of what it is purely entirely in and of itself. We think of it in its relations to other things and most especially its relation to living things, um, which is, it, I almost think that to give a real definition of inorganic being, you have to include its relationality to other things to do so. So you think um, then, and I, this, this is actually, I'm actually quite sympathetic to this. This, is, this sounds good to me that to give a full explanation of something, if it's something that is just inherently limited, you're going to have to at least include some sort of extrinsic causal explanation to that. Is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I would say something like water, uh, it's extrinsic final causality is part of what it is, right? Right. Uh, water right. is for the sake of other things living. Right? Yeah. Um, so the H2O would, it just would not be fully satisfactory in terms right. of. Right. It's, yeah. it's a sufficient material definition, I guess we could say, but yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's ignoring the total reality in which its formal existence situates it. Um, so yeah, you know, I think that's, uh, you can't just say that it, it is what it is with something that, that does have a strictly material, strictly non-living uh, existence. Mm -hmm. And even with things like plants and, and animals, right? Most of the intelligibility that we deal with, with regards to those is in their environmental contextualization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, certain plants we, okay, these are good for eating. These are not good for eating. Uh, these have a role with other parts of the ecology in which they exist. They're eaten by these animals and not by these others, or they provide some sustenance for other plants, which are eaten by animals. Right. Um, so it's, it's really that, that sort of complex web uh, mm -hmm. of how these things interact, which grants their, their proper intelligibility, I think. Yeah, yeah. I know we said this would be an introductory talk, but this is too much fun. I just want to I want to keep going with this. Um, OK, then. So oh, all right, where does because you, you mentioned semiotics, where does this fit into your um, project here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the well, let me let me bring it back into the conversation a little bit um, yep. that uh, what I mean, uh, semiotics um, very broadly would be defined as the study of the action of signs. Right. Um, how how signs operate in the universe, and uh, I mean, it's, it's such a broad study because really signs are everywhere. Yeah. Everything that we know is known by really a multitude of signs, and even our knowledge of it is constituted through signs. Mm -hmm. And this is um, where it sort of enters the history of philosophy discussion that. Uh, um, my my doctoral uh, director advisor John Dealey um, was probably one of the biggest names in, in semiotics in the 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, he wrote a ton. He wrote a ton of books. He wrote uh, uh, a lot of articles um, trying to to sort of bring Thomism and semiotics together because he saw that natural complementarity there. Um, uh, and, and actually, I have a plug that will remind me to make about that uh, later on when we come towards the close. Of course. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, uh, you know, semiotics is the study of the action of signs. Um, and interestingly, it was also defined by, by Charles Peirce at one point as the normative science of truth, um, which is a fascinating it's idea. Quite, quite, yeah, quite a... Uh -huh. um, so when, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, the importance of it, or why I think it's important, I guess, why it enters into to realism and a study of reality and an understanding of the real world, uh, the real universe in which we live. Um, I always sort of come back to that debate of of uh, realism versus idealism. Mm -hmm. That I, idealism, the fundamental premise of idealism, the whole way of ideas, as Leibniz called it, you know, from Descartes up until uh, really Hegel. Hegel's sort of a borderline case, I think, mm -hmm. but also continuing into contemporary analytic philosophy. Uh, there's a presupposition which is just sort of taken for granted by so many of the idealists and not really questioned that the direct and immediate objects of our knowledge 
are the ideas in our own minds. Right. Mm -hmm. That we know our ideas. And then by knowing our ideas, we make a further leap to knowing things, which is why from Descartes through Kant, at the very least, all of the discussion is how do we cross this chasm mm -hmm. right, between the mind and the world? How do we get there? But no one ever stops and questions, wait a second, did we make a mistake right at the very beginning? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I should have worn my, I have another Lyceum shirt that says uh, uh, in Latin, uh, a small error in the beginning becomes great in the end. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I should have worn that one for today. Um, <clears throat> but no one stops and questions this. No one stops and says, wait, wait, wait a second. Are our ideas what we actually know? Mm -hmm. And this is to ignore really the whole Latin scholastic tradition building up from, um, you know, Aristotle and into Boethius and, and Aquinas and the whole Thomistic school, which is no, our ideas, our concepts are signs. And in fact, they're nothing but signs, right? Formal they, signs, right? Formal, formal signs. signs. Mm -hmm. All they do is direct our minds to, to something else. Mm -hmm. And once you recognize that, once you realize that, wait a second, this whole mental picture, mental imaging idealists, I, you know, conception it actually makes no sense like that's no way to to try and explain our experience our, our cognitive lives our intellectual experience our, our thinking our, our thoughts no that really we're always engaged in this this process of signification to mm -hmm. ourselves and to others and signification is always it's it's a complex process right um What's signified never exhausts the object signified, or the signification never exhausts the object signified. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're always dealing with trying to learn more about these objects. That's mm -hmm. part of our cognitive, you know, proceeding. Um, so we talk about something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, realism. Well, it's never a full, complete grasp of the reality. We're always working it out through signs. We're always working it out through a semiotic process of the interpretation of how signs are acting in our own lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that helps dispel so many of the errors which have come about as a consequence of idealism. That once we make this sort of turn towards a, a, a semiotic realism, as, as I've, I've called it, um, it really helps us to bring things into a much greater coherence. Right. Uh -huh. And so to, to correspond to this with something like an Aristotelian metaphysics mm -hmm. uh, and a broadly Thomistic perspective, um, you know, Aquinas, when he talks about um, understanding things, uh, when he talks about the, the process of resolution, the way of resolution, he calls it, there's a way of resolution metaphysically Right, which is a resolution of causality, a resolution of existence. Um, so how do we, we explain the causal you know, chain of being, as it were, up to, to God? Yeah. Uh, but then there's a, a converse motion that he describes very briefly. And I, I, it's one of those things that like, why, why didn't you write more about this? Story? I know he's, he uh, does that a couple of times, you know, uh, he just, uh, just a little bit, but it's, and it's easy yeah. to miss with Aquinas, sometimes really important points, but uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. But there's this, this resolution to, to being as the first object of our intellect, that yeah. first primordial conception that we form, which comprises not just the existence of things, that cognition independent uh, motion towards greater and greater absoluteness or greater and greater existence or independence of existence, but also just to the intelligibility of things, including things which don't exist at all of themselves. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. intelligibility of privations and negations yeah. uh, and cognition dependent relations. And so I think that's where, where semiotics comes in because it helps us understand how these things fit into that universal sign mediated constitution of reality right so the the idea here and is 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 that um if it, if it were not for uh our sort of contact with other real being there wouldn't even be an intellect in operation we wouldn't even have self-knowledge right yeah You're right and um I, no i think that's no i think that's correct um but of course, the idealist isn't going to isn't going to just grant that, right? <laughs> they're going to they're right. going to say it's just assertion or question begging, right? So how how could we 
how could we further motivate that that thesis, right? Because if that thesis is correct, then we can see that really mind is transparent to being, being is transparent to mind. There's just this, this great sort of, um, yeah, knittedness there, really unnecessary knittedness, uh, certainly, certainly for us. And then we don't really have this sort of mind world divide anymore. So one could see why that would be a very attractive picture. Um, and laying it out as, as a theory seems to kind of cover a great range of the data. But is there more that can be said in favor for the theory against the the idealist? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I I, I think um, <clears throat> this is always this has uh, become a sticking point over the last several months with all sorts of things, all sorts of conversations I've had that a lot of people just aren't actually willing to have the conversation, um, and that's often I find is the case with the idealist um, because you have to question, okay, well, where do where do these things come from, right? Um, you have to question the presuppositions. And if the idealist isn't willing to, to have those presuppositions brought into to question, then they're not really interested in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, because that's where, where you ask, okay, well, where do these ideas actually come from? What makes you, convinces you that, you know, they're spontaneous or that they're innate or that um, they're, you know, constituted um, in that sort of Kantian schema, right? You know, how how can you be convinced that that's foundational? Even Kant, right? Kant, uh, his his sort of noumenal veil has chinks in it in his system. There are ways that you have to have faith in the noumenal in in the Kantian system, mm -hmm. right? That other minds operate the way that your minds operate. Uh, for for I mean, that's just a huge presumption that he has to make to say that okay, well, this is universally true. Mm -hmm. That everyone has this this table of categories in their minds. Uh, these these primordial twelve conceptions uh, across the four primary categories, right? Uh, that without those. Without that presumption, you're just speaking into the void. Right. Now, now you brought up an important point that I think clarifies something that you were asking me about before. You brought up you brought up inatism. And I know because I, when I was talking about intuitions, I wasn't I wasn't endorsing a form of, of inatism. Now I know Lonergan wants to maybe say that certain heuristic structures might be uh sort of there uh innately, right? Um but no, I'm not I'm not advocating uh Inatism. I, I think that that has a, as a host of problems. Unless you just want to just take the uh, people would probably see this the the sort of nuclear option of just saying, yeah, there's this dump truck of ideas that God just unloaded, and and I, I right, and I don't I don't see how you could secure inatism without a direct appeal to to God or something on that. So I don't know if that relates to what you said before, but <coughs> I, I well yeah, that, I, yeah I mean. Um, just to clarify what I was talking about, I wasn't right. advocating editism. Yeah, right. And so even something like you know heuristic structures, depending upon what we mean by that, um, you know, there's there's natural. Uh, I would say, I mean, really biological um, sort of heuristics, right? That we have uh, in in the structure of the brain and the structure of our perceptual framework of, of understanding, which are dispositive for our intellectual procession. Right. There, there are, there, I mean, we have an essence, right? Which means there's, right. there's a structure to us and that will include our cognitive structure. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the intellect is, is fundamentally indeterminate in, in the sort of universal scope of being as the first object of our intellect. It's, I mean, that's, it's like prime matter, right? right? It is like prime matter, right? It's, it's purely indeterminate of its own, uh, um, you know, scope, uh, although uniquely tied to real encounters with things at the same time, um, because our, our understanding to be complete always has to come back to particulars. That's, mm -hmm. that's the nature of our, our human existence is that we have to have a, a sense particularity, a sense perceptual particularity to, to complete any understanding that we have, which again, uh, that's, that's a, series of, of one sign leading to another sign, which returns to the first sign and goes back to the thing itself. Um, so, you know, if you think about uh, uh, our perception of anything, right? our perception of, uh, you know, I'm looking across the, the street at my neighbor's uh, inflatable Mickey Mouse cr Christmas ornament, right? Uh, Christmas lawn decoration. I hate the inflatable thing. Very, so. very pious, yes. Uh -huh. Very pious. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, there's, there's just there's the sense sign of it right the the color of it the shape of it uh there's the perceptual sign of it the um 
object over there that I find visibly offensive in some way. Uh, and then there's the, the intellectual conception of it, right? Um, which is that it's, it's a fictional character of a certain nature of a blow up lawn ornament and uh, the intellectual valuation of it as tacky, right? No, that's, it's all back to the thing itself. Right? Yeah, and even going back to the thing itself, the thing itself is a sign of other things. Right, it's it's a sign of of Disney of, uh, um, I don't know, bad judgment on my neighbor's part. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's yeah, so it's always that's... leading to something else, right? It's always right. leading a, to some other object. Right, a sign of a of a man of low estate, undoubtedly. Right, um, <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> we're a little snobby here at philosophy for the people. That's all right. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can't. So yeah, some some things are, are are the thing in itself, but they, they can also be signs. But then we also talk about formal signs, right? Things like their very nature just is to direct or to, or to point, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and so that's that's one of the main divisions that um, goes back to um, you know the Latin tradition of these things. Mm -hmm. um, really, I mean, Augustine's a huge figure in this as well. Um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm doing a lecture on Augustine on the 15th of January. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Uh, so I gotta I gotta start turning those wheels around. Um, but yeah, one of the divisions that the Latin scholastics make are, are between you know, formal signs and instrumental signs. Yeah, an instrumental sign being something that has to be perceived as an object in its own right first before you can recognize the sign relation that it constitutes. Like smoke. Like smoke, right? You have to see the smoke to understand that it's a, a, a sign of the fire. You right. have to perceive it. The stop sign, you have to perceive the stop sign to recognize the law that it signifies. Mm -hmm. Whereas formal signs are really only our concepts. Um, and, and there's there's a debate as to whether our percepts are formal or instrumental signs as well. Um, I'd say they're, they're formal signs because, again, they're always directing us to, yeah. to extra cognitive objects, even if it's a purely imaginatively constituted one. Um, colors and shapes and things are all um, objective in the sense that they are are the objects that we constitute in principle mm -hmm. public and communicable to others. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where where we started from and how we ended up where we are. I don't know it's it's super interesting though, but um, th actually, there's a connection here, right? Because and um, or at least maybe we can dis dis disambiguate something. So take um about the the notion of determinacy or exactness of, of conceptual content or meaning right because uh you're probably familiar right with with ross's argument right um for yeah. the immateriality of, of the intellect and, and his argument is kind of playing off of formal signs right and he's saying look there actually is determinacy of meaning here but that's incompatible with any physical reality right um now he supports supports those claims through various arguments right but he's like if that's the case which i think it is then there's going to be some some power that we have right that is unambiguous and exact in its conceptual content that, that cannot be reduced to to any any physical entity including brain states or, or this or whatever how does that connect with what what you've been saying uh here and also what you said before about determinacy or do you part ways with ross there uh i mean i'm probably half and half, I don't know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're one foot on the same path, one foot on different ones. Um, yeah, you know, I think, um, so the uh, precise sort of faculty we have, or power that we have, which is capable of transcending the physical, let's say, mm -hmm. um, I think that's recognizable when we can acknowledge the reality of what's irreducibly uh, or irreducible to the physical in physical things, right? So the, um, well, not everyone might share my judgment, my snobby judgment of the tackiness of the Mickey Mouse inflatable lawn ornament, right? Um, it's still intelligible to everyone what I mean there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, why I would say that even, they may not agree with the judgment, but they can understand the why of it. Mm -hmm. and the predication of it of this object so where does that come from right if not from something which is irreducible to the physical you can't go dissect that lawn ornament and find the tackiness molecule in it right or the um, gaudiness molecule or, or the gaudiness molecule um <clears throat> yeah or you know whatever sort of uh, uh um adjective like that that we could throw on it right? mm -hmm. um you know i can say that it's it's 
wide or red or something like that. Okay, you can go find those in in physical dimensions in an in an imperiometric uh, schemata of investigation, but you can't go find the tackiness of it. Uh, just as you can't go find the the beauty in 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 a Caravaggio or something like that, right? Right. Um, you can give reasons why. You can give causal explanations that contribute to it, but you're still never going to find the the beauty there physically explicable. Um, so I, I think in that regard, um, it's it's very much the same um, that I would agree probably with with Ross in the way that he's addressing these things. Right. Um, however, I, I do think that we need to acknowledge that there's a continuity at the same time that it's not segmented layers of meaning. Right. Uh, it's not as though the intelligible exists on one plane and the physical exists on another, but rather the physical exists only because of what we recognize ultimately as the intelligible there in the first place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, we... it's, it's, it's elevated according to our mode of being, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, it, even in itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we do make the distinctions um, to, to separate out the intelligible from the physical, to mm -hmm. recognize the, the intelligible um, in a way that it's not present there in the physical, uh, but it's a different mode. Um, so maybe I think uh, that's what you're saying, mo elevated according to our mode of existence, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. But that's it's right, there. Yeah. It's there to begin with, right? And we're just, um, you know, adding the intelligibility to the actuality that's there. We're constituting that relation of intelligibility. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, yeah. I'm, I think that answers your question. It does. You no, know, no, it does. Um, what? <laughs> it's just. I see. This is this is the kind of conversations I love to have because we kind of been all over the place. Uh, but to just kind of swing it back around. Um, what 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 is the big takeaway, uh, Doctor Kemble, that you think that, that from from all this territory that we've covered so far in relation to philosophy of realism? He had to extract a nugget or two of saying, I want people to take this away from <laughs> this yeah, wide ranging um, conversation that we've had so far. Well, well I mean, I'm actually going to pull this back to something that I uh, was talking about. So if there's, there's any Lyceum Institute members watching, um, we have a, we have a happy hour every, every Tuesday, uh, although we might be changing days. Um, and we were talking last night about all the various ways in which we, sort of lose the thread of of what knowledge is right so there's um you can have a sort of uh um, and we this unfolded in the context of faith and reason uh, that you can have a sort of fideistic approach to to knowledge right that sure only the knowledge granted by faith really matters and everything else is sort of superficial and, and you know uh, uh, superfluous to to our existence then conversely you can have a scientistic uh, approach to knowledge then okay well only that which can be verified by you know Im imperiometric methodologies and and quantified is it really constitutes knowledge and everything else is just opinion uh, then you can also have a sort of gnostic approach to things that okay well everything that we see that we sense that we encounter in the real world is a symbol of some higher reality and it's there's no uh, clear causal explanation for how we we transcend to this right, so right. special mm -hmm. knowledge privileged knowledge and that's the real knowledge and then you can have a, a sort of pseudo philosophic sophistry right that okay well uh, which is very close i think probably to the gnosticism that um you know th through philosophy or through uh some sort of, of you know, advanced study, we come to understand what's really real and everyone else is just a, you know, a common sense, you know, is, is for the people. Uh, it's not for the philosopher. That's right. That's um, right. And so I think what, if, if we're to tie everything together here is that really a, a philosophy of realism rejects all of those, right? Because mm -hmm. it acknowledges that there's a multitude of sources of our knowledge, um, but our knowledge is always other directed right right other people other things it's always pointing towards it's not something that we possess as though it belongs to us mm. the most we possess are signs of what is to be known right right uh-huh and so right. mm -hmm. there's so, a so kind of natural humility that goes along with that i think 
yeah uh, which is essential to to being a philosopher whether you're a professional uh with degrees or you're someone who just loves wisdom right so so knowledge is not just analogical but there's this relational aspect to it as well right yeah yeah. Um, the, the, yeah and and i think that's also um you know uh we're, we're so bound up in individualism in our culture uh that we we very easily lapse into that i possess this mentality yeah, right mm -hmm. uh, rather than the the properly communal uh reality that is knowledge knowledge isn't something that you possess it's something that you participate in with others mm -hmm. uh, you have to have conversations like we're having um have conversations with other people about things in order really to progress in knowledge at all i think yeah yeah i i think this was a great example of it i mean we uh we had a genuine conversation a lot of clarifications uh helpful for me certainly so i hope it was helpful for the listeners as well um what so uh, okay so before we wrap up here what is coming down if there's anything else you want to mention or squeeze in please do but what's coming down the pipeline uh in terms of uh event you said you're giving a, a lecture on saint augustine tell us about the lyceum institute where people can check that out and what they have to look forward to yeah so uh lots lots going on with the lyceum institute um to just throw the the link out there for everyone um it's very easy it's lyceum.institute no dot com, no dot org or anything, just lyceum dot institute. Um, there's there's a news page on there that you can find all sorts of announcements. Um, so we've got seminars coming up for 2022. We've got 10 of them. Uh, I won't go through listing all of them here, but there's an introduction to philosophical thinking if anyone's interested in that. So very, very introductory level. Reading some Plato, reading some stuff of mine, um, just awesome. trying to, to work into the habit of, of philosophical thinking. We've got, as I mentioned, a logic course, which is uh, free to all members of the Lyceum Institute. Uh, there's Latin study starting, uh, both elementary and intermediate levels, also included in the price of membership for all Lyceum Institute members. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, uh, probably some other things I can't remember. A lot of colloquia, different you know speakers coming in, giving a one hour or so lecture and live Q and A. Um, so more, more on that will be coming soon. And the Lyceum Institute is also partnering with uh, many institutions, primarily the University of Coimbra in Portugal, hmm. to do a uh, 2022 international open seminar on semiotics, where we've got about 50 speakers lined up from all around the world, giving lectures on uh, both historical and sort of doctrinal issues within semiotics. Hmm. Um, so you can find a I'll link to that on the bottom of the Lyceum Institute page. Uh, very large schedule. Uh, I'll be giving lectures on Augustine, uh, Aquinas, um, Ponceau, and honestly, I'm blanking on a fourth one. <laughs> uh, or, no, I'm giving commentary on someone else's uh, discussion on Ponceau. That's what it is. Um, so John Ponceau, 17th century Thomistic philosopher, also known as John of St. Thomas. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of lots of stuff going on there. Lots of good stuff, um, and that's uh, that that international open seminar uh, is going to be just a heck of heck of heck of a program. Uh, I already gave an interview for it, so you can find that as well. Um, lots and lots of good stuff there. Great. Well, we'll link all of that in the show notes. And I again just want to encourage everybody. Uh, to support the good work that you're doing because they're going to benefit from it greatly. Obviously, if they're a subscriber to Philosophy of the People, you're going to feel right at home and and really enjoy not just uh, Reality Journal, but uh, Lyceum Institute as well. So I'll link all that stuff in the show notes. And uh, Dr. Kempel, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll have to do it again here soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Pat. <laughs>